Okay. Does that, that send you a, remind, a little announcement? Yep, fabulous. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our book launch and discussion of a strategic nature, public relations and the politics of American environmentalism by Melissa Ranchik and Maria Espinosa. And this book is hot off the press from Oxford University Press. And I am Jeff Lane. I'm an associate professor at Rutgers in the School of Communication and Information. And I co-chair along with uh, Melissa, the Rutgers Digital Ethnography Working Group, or DUG as we like to call it. And this is a group dedicated to supporting ethnographic research in the digital age and to building fellowship and providing workshops and training and writing groups and really making sure we have the resources we need to do ethnographic field work in an online and offline world. And our group includes faculty, postdocs, and doctoral students at the School of Communication and Information, other units at Rutgers and at other universities. And we have quite a few members on the call now. Um, so I'm gonna drop in the chat our uh, website which includes a mailing list that we'd love to have you join and an events page where you'll find details about our next public event, which is a panel on doing digital ethnography. That's in partnership with the Ethnographic Cafe and that's on April 8th. And I'll be on that panel along with Andre Brock and Sophie Bishop and Nick Seaver. And we're gonna be talking about some different interpretations of digital ethnography. So I'll add that to the chat along with our um, Twitter handle at Doug and a link to um, Melissa and Maria's book. So let me drop all that in the chat before I forget. Okay, and I'll also flag that we have an Annex uh, podcast episode about our working group that will be coming out soon. And I will share that as well um, when that's available. And we are continuing today with our public book talks. And this is where we celebrate and discuss new, oh, thank you for correcting my uh, Twitter mistake there. Okay. Um, so this is a continuation of our public book talks where we celebrate and discuss new and important ethnographic books. And in these talks, we get into the big ideas of the book, of course, but we also, draw the curtains on how ethnography gets done. And we make a point of getting into the data and the relationships and the dilemmas of, of the field work as well. So this talk will be in that spirit and we'll hear from our authors, our co-authors for about 40 or 45 minutes. And then I'll open it up to, um, or open up for, for question and answer. Um, you are welcome to type any questions in the chat as the talk goes on, um, or we can wait until, or you can wait until the end. And I will um, either read your question from the chat, or if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you. So I will be our moderator. Um, methods related questions are certainly welcome, given the nature of the event and the group. Um, we're going to aim to finish in about an hour and a half, so by about two thirty. All right, so um, that's kind of the background. And let me introduce now our fabulous authors of A Strategic Nature, uh, both of whom are members of Duke. So we have um, Dr. Melissa Aronchik. And um, Melissa Aronchik is an associate professor in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers and does work on media, publicity, and the environment, and is published in Environmental Sociology, New Media and Society, Enterprise and Society, among other places, and has been featured in the Washington Post and on a podcast called Drilled. And before this book, she is the author of uh, Branding the Nation, The Global Business of National Identity, and the co-editor of Blowing Up the Brand, Critical Perspectives on Promotional Culture. And then our other author, Maria Espinosa, is a PhD candidate in the sociology department at Rutgers University. And her research centers on risk communication, environmental politics, and the climate health nexus. 
and her work has been published in social science and medicine, big data and society, environmental sociology, and uh, climatic change. And she has worked both in the social sector and the private sector in the area of social and environmental impact. So I will turn it over now to our authors. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for moderating. Um, thanks to Holly Avella, our coordinator, without whom these events would not come together. And thanks to the Doug community. I'm so grateful we have this group to think through our research, share ideas, and write together. And of course, um, thanks to all of you for being here today, especially the day before spring break for some of us. So I especially appreciate uh, all of you being here. At base, this book is actually not about PR or about environmentalism. The book is about how we understand public problems. The big picture of a strategic nature is that in order for a public problem to be understood, both as public and as a problem in our current democracy, it needs to be formulated in a particular way. And that way involves a combination of information, mediation, and publicity. That's the lens we bring to the emergence of environmentalism as an idea in America. The book covers the long 20th century of environmental awareness and shows how publicity in the form of public relations has mediated and rendered legitimate certain ways of thinking about the environment while leaving others behind. There are so many ways I want to talk about this book. Um, there, it has been such a fascinating and massive undertaking for us. But because our talk today is taking place in the context of, context of our ethnography group, and also because I know we have a fairly varied audience today, Maria and I are gonna focus a little less on the theoretical dimensions of the book and a little more on the method of inquiry how we decided to collect information for the book, how we found the people who helped us tell the story in the book, and how we tried to make sense of it. Of course, in the q and I'm happy to get into the theory. Um, and I also wanted to mention a couple of standalone articles um, that Maria and I wrote that are connected to the book and that are a little more technical if you are interested in diving more into the theory. So this is a piece in the journal Environmental Sociology, on public relations consultants as an epistemic community. This is a piece in the journal Big Data and Society on how private sector groups and tech companies promote their continued collection of user data by claiming that the data can help solve problems related to climate change. I've written up some pieces of the book for the popular press as well. Uh, this story is in the news for a number of reasons these days. And uh, we can also talk about that later if anyone's interested in hearing about that. And finally, Jeff mentioned um, podcasts. Um, we've got a couple of podcast interviews that summarize some of the ideas in the book. The Annex Sociology podcast is really about the digital ethnography working group. It's a conversation among Jeff, uh, myself and Jabari Evans, another member of our group who's at South Carolina. Um, but there are a few things I say about the book in that uh, podcast as well, if you're interested. So today, I want to tell the story of E. Bruce Harrison. Who is E. Bruce Harrison? Well, I can start by saying that he's the backbone of this book. And that's for two reasons. First, because of how important Harrison was to the story of public relations around environmental problems. E. Bruce Harrison was an American PR consultant. He graduated from the University of Alabama in 1954, moved to Washington, D.C. in 1957 to work as press secretary for Alabama Congressman Kenneth A. Roberts, moved from there to the private sector where he was manager of environmental information for the Chemical Manufacturers Association, the major trade association for that industry. And in the 1970s, he opened his own PR firm, which would exist in various forms through the early 2000s. Over the course of that 
nearly 50 year career in green public relations. Harrison was behind PR campaigns for some of the biggest environmental polluters of the 20th century, from General Motors to Monsanto to RJ Reynolds to BP America. I'm guessing that most of you have never heard of him. He was not by any means a household name. And that fact says a lot about the business of PR and the way it works to create and orchestrate the spread of ideas in society. PR is a behind the scenes industry. The success of a big PR campaign is precisely to make it seem as though its ideas and points of view just naturally enter into the public conversation. The second reason Harrison was so instrumental to the ideas in our book is that he wanted to be part of our book. He wanted to be part of the story of how public relations shaped the way we see the environment today. And that quality of wanting to be part of the story is a very deep facet of human nature. Wanting to be known, recognized for who you are, or maybe especially who you want to be or what you want to be known for, that's a very powerful motivator for how we act in public. I was nervous about contacting uh, Harrison, sending him an email when I started the research for this book. I knew from hours of reading and some initial poking around in archives that he was a big fish in the sea and that I wanted to talk to him, but I assumed he would say no or just not respond. I thought it would be better to contact smaller fish first and then see if they could help me communicate with him. That's what I had done for my first book. But I took the plunge. This was February of 2017, and I sent a short email. Not three hours later, I got a reply inviting me to come to Washington, D.C., where Harrison was then teaching as an adjunct instructor at Georgetown University in their communication and PR master's program. So we met on the Georgetown campus. He showed up holding a copy of my first book on nation branding, so we had both done some homework. We had an interview. The interview went well. Lots of talk about his background and his work with his PR firm, which was called the E. Bruce Harrison Company. And I remember at one point as we were finishing up and I said how glad I was that he took the time to talk to me, he said he had also really enjoyed our talk and could he have my mailing address. A few days later, a package arrived at my door. Over the next several months, I would receive seven packages with books, articles, and reports from Harrison's company library. And each package came with a personal handwritten note. I want to read three of these notes out loud um, to give you a sense of his intentions. So I'll start at the top. Note one, Melissa, some of this may be relevant. I enjoyed our conversation and admire your work and your manner of inquiry. You're a good reporter. Listen learn, leverage, lead, Bruce. Number two, Melissa, with apology, more stuff. Please holler when you've had enough. If you have time, call me when you're in DC. Thank you for your interest in me and my team, Bruce. He mentions DC. Um, I was returning to Washington because Harrison put me in touch with some of his former employees so that I could interview them as well. Note three, Melissa, tell me when to stop. I'm seeing a link to your smart analysis in your book. That's my first book, Branding the Nation. Green sustainability began in Rio as a desirable, inevitable theme of nation branding. Tell me if I'm wrong, Bruce. Rio refers to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, otherwise known as the Earth Summit, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. Those of you who are interested in environmental policy will know that this UN conference marked a major turning point in the role of business in environmental problem solving. This photo um, that I showed you before that Harrison sent me, that's him at the Earth Summit. 
So he was there in Rio. This photo is dated June 3rd, 1992. And on the back of the photo, he had written me a note. It says, I would later that day participate in a panel of journalists and company PR people as moderator. My talk was first use of term sustainable communication. E. Bruce Harris, Washington, DC. So now Maria and I had a lot of work to do. And that work involved collecting or connecting, I should say, a lot of dots, trying to figure out how and in what way all of these notes and materials and ideas connected. What was the connection between the material Harrison was sending me from his company, his annotations in the margins, and especially his comments to me about who else I ought to speak to, what else I might think about. And especially the question for us was where to situate public relations in all this. I wanna back up for a minute now to talk about some of the standard narratives of environmental politics in the US and how we think they play into this story. When I was first thinking about this book back in 2016, I had the chance to talk about some early ideas with the sociologist, Phil Smith, who's at, at Yale. And he gave me some advice that ended up being a key to this book. He said, can you avoid writing an expose of evil, nefarious, polluting corporations on one side and good guy environmental fighters on the other? We already have a lot of excellent research on the social organization of anti-environmentalism. And we tend to understand that organization in terms of dichotomies, dichotomies of power, political polarization, and anti-reflexivity. What happens if you take a more ethnographic approach? What if we consider this story in terms of life trajectories? Asking, for instance, how do PR people make sense of what they do every day? What matters to them? What pressures do they perceive in their work and how do these change over time? And then how do they respond to these changing pressures? And where and when do they draw the line, especially in this kind of a context? If we think about the business of PR, I said earlier that PR is built on not being in the public eye. It's the central irony, actually, of the business. You know, PR doesn't like PR. If we, ordinary people, pay attention to PR at all, it's usually when there's a PR disaster and something seems to fail. But public relations is hiding in plain sight all the time. So many of our modern media innovations, information, publicity innovations are touched by PR. PR forms part of the structures of democracy that we hold up as social ideals. Think of how we value the participation of many voices in democratic debate. The spirit of compromise and collaboration that in our ideal democratic setting that we see happening. The ideal of transparency as a public good and the belief that more information is the source of better knowledge. If we think about PR only in terms of misinformation or spin or lies, we're really missing the big picture of how embedded are the ideas, ideas of publicity in our modern democracy. This nexus of information mediation and publicness. And I think the story is much more like Timothy Mitchell's carbon democracy than it is like sociological categories of group identity and values. I said I wouldn't get into the theory. Here's the, here's the 30 second version of the theory. Timothy Mitchell says, we live not in a democratic system that is stopped up by fossil fuels. We live in a democratic system created by fossil fuels. So understanding public relations in that system 
means understanding how public relations is integral to and continues to shape that system. So Maria and I took these ideas. We took these ideas of participation, compromise, collaboration, transparency, information, and we looked at how public relations uses these ideas and takes advantage of them in their work. And this was when Harrison's outreach to me began to make sense. He was treating me like he treats all issues that present themselves to him. He was trying to relate to me and to the ideas I had about him so that he could shape them. This is the relations in public relations. It's extremely effective. It also had me sort of humbled realizing I'm being PR'd by my PR guy. <laughs> like he's, <laughs> you know, in these messages and in this information that he was sending me, he wasn't just relating. Like he was shaping. He was shaping the way I saw him. He was shaping the story of his work and he was shaping the story of environmentalism as he had done over his career. Harrison had this habit that I found very charming, which was to call the book our book like his and mine. So we were collaborating on our book, you know, together. He would write to me, you know, here's a new idea for our book. Here's someone you should speak to about our book. So <laughs> um, it was really something. I, I stopped hearing from him in 2020. Um, he had been ill for some time. And as some of you know, he, he passed away in January of 21. So a little over a year ago. And what happened between Harrison and me is in some ways a, a once in a lifetime research opportunity. I now have hundreds of documents to learn from and continue to write about. And I see this now as a kind of responsibility I have to tell the version of the story that this experience that I'm relating to you tells in addition to the documents themselves. In other ways, I was very interested to discover that this is not a once in a lifetime experience. I don't know if anyone here has read Stuart Ewan's 1996 book, A Social History of Spin. Um, the introduction to that book details Stuart Ewan's relationship with Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays, uh, by some accounts, considered the father of public relations, although chances are he invented that title for himself. He was so great at PR. Uh, Bernays lived from 1891 to 1995, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, worked for hundreds of companies across all sectors in the U.S. and abroad. And Stuart Ewan met him at the end of his life when he was 99. I mean, end of his life, I think he was 104 when he passed away. But wouldn't you know, in the introduction to A Social History of Spin, we find that Bernays PR'd Stuart Ewan the same way that Harrison PR'd me. So maybe it's not an anomaly. Maybe it's a pattern. And maybe we need to think more about the charismatic authority of certain people and certain professions. Now, what does all this mean for environmental politics? Um, in a minute, I'm gonna turn things over to Maria, who's gonna talk about this. But I just wanna say one more thing briefly about this good guy, bad guy narrative that I alluded to. Um, I don't, again, I don't know if anyone has heard of this group. This group is called Energy Policy Advocates. This is from the homepage of their website. So you can just search them and find them quickly. Um, this is the Energy Policy Advocates is a small group of attorneys and other folks associated with the coal industry, which uses freedom of information access requests, FOIA requests, to solicit information from the government and from public sector organizations about environmental policies that they see as potentially damaging their clients' interests. So these are just some screenshots from their website. What you see in the corner with this map is their map of FOIA inquiries and related files. And then if you click through, you'll see a list of all of the documents they've obtained from their FOIA requests per state. And you can click on, they're all PDFs and you can click and see their requests, um, and then their responses, the PDFs that they've received. 
a group of climate researchers that I'm part of was targeted by this energy policy advocates group. So I received in January a FOIA request for my emails because Rutgers is a public university, so we're subject to this. It's pretty clear now that these are fishing expeditions and not targeted requests for something specific, at least not initially, but it does tell us something about the culture of harassment and intimidation that researchers on contentious public issues are susceptible to. I've been thinking a lot about getting FOIA'd by this group and what it means. And I think these days that this was a major misstep by this organization. Because what this kind of thing does, in addition to creating this culture of harassment and intimidation, is to reinforce this narrative of good guys and bad guys. It supports the idea that corporate intermediaries, like here corporate attorneys or PR people, are ill-intentioned and untrustworthy. And this in turn reinforces efforts by environmental advocates and researchers to impose narratives of regulation and control. Because the perspective is these people have no scruples, they need to be controlled. And this is relevant from a research perspective because I think we, we need to consider more carefully what this regulatory narrative both enables us to do and prevents us from doing. So for instance, yes, it might press us to ask certain hard questions about what these groups are really up to, but it might also prevent us from asking questions about what this narrative doesn't do, or we overlook other ways that the narrative could happen besides or beyond a good guy, bad guy approach. And that's a whole other level of risk for us as researchers. The risk that we might stop asking the kinds of questions that let us fully understand the culture of publicity and how it's affected our ability to respond to environmental problems and now the climate crisis. So I'm gonna unshare my screen. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Maria and uh, she's gonna pick it up where I left off. Thank you, Melissa. Um, sorry, just one moment to share my screen. Can you see my screen? It sounds... Yeah, just put the presenter view. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so thanks, Melissa. And I'm going to continue the conversation on what PR means for environmental politics. And to do this, I'm going to talk about chapter five of the book where we discuss how Bruce Harrison exported the concept of environmental communication to the European Union. And as Melissa noted, uh, earlier version of this chapter in the form of an article is available in environmental sociology. Okay, so as Melissa noted, Harrison worked for the most contentious industries, such as the chemical, the oil, gas, and automobile companies from the mid 1950s to the late 1990s. And by the time that he creates his own firm, the E. Bruce Harrison Company in 1973, Harrison already has a lot of experience in the realm of PR that he liked to call green communication. During the 60s, he had worked for the chemical lobby and one of his biggest tasks during that time was to discredit the first wave of environmentalism that was fueled by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and later on by Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed. He failed at time, but he learned that companies needed to deal with environmental issues, that instead of ne negating the existence, denying the existence of environmental problems, you needed to address them and manage them. So the goal of Harrison Company was to give, give his clients the tools and context to speak about the environment and make authoritative claims. So they will be taken seriously when talking about environmental problems. And as you see here, he's, you know, in this advertising from EVH, it says environmental uh, affairs here, and it's, he's trying to highlight that at most public relations companies is an emerging field, but at Harrison, that's their core business. Um, I also would like to mention that 
one of Harrison's first uh, environmental client was the National Environmental Development Association, also called NIDA, which was an environmental coalition formed by a number of industry groups that tried to soften or prevent federal regulation. And he had created NIDA, and then through his firm, the Harrison firm, he created NIDA two groups, one to focus on the Cleaner Act and another on the Clean Water Act. And I'm giving this example just to give you a sense that his clients did not necessarily change their production or their business styles, but they did adopt the view that environmental problems needed to be managed and that companies needed to be perceived as problem solvers. And so in early 1989, Harrison decides to expand his brand of green communication, and he enters in partnership with a Brussels-based firm, uh, Andersor Alfred Felix, AEF. This partnership will later become known as Embargo in 1994, and it was the first international network of public relations companies to focus exclusively on green PR and on disseminating environmental communication expertise among its members and clients. Um, this network is very important because it transforms green PR from a specialized skill into part of the dogma of environmental management. And choosing a partner operating in Brussels was very strategic for EVH, for Bruce Harrison, because he saw an opportunity in the regional integration of one of the world's biggest marketplaces, the European Union. And he thought that in this case, the opportunity would be that European companies could learn from his expertise with American companies that had already been exposed to environmental controls by federal bodies such as the EPA in the context of the right to know legislation. And at the same time, American companies that were operating abroad needed advice on how to navigate the new rules such as eco-labeling and emission restrictions being discussed at the European Parliament. So this partnership between Anderfall, Ipers, Felix, and Harrison International starts as an early warning system for client companies. And here's a list of the agent institutions involved in the making of the European Community Environmental Policy that they were monitoring in, 1890, in 1989. Sorry. And a second role of this partnership was to influence policy creation through strategic lobbying. Um, so, you know, Harrison being a PR guy, of course, he created, a, you know, he had a PR approach for green PR. So as part of his quest to convince companies to join and integrate to this network, he started doing activities in Europe. Um, and he started doing different types of events to advertise the concept of green communication. And so, for example, in these media events, one of the things they did was to promote the book, How to Win in Washington, very practical advice about lowering the grassroots and the media, written by the vice president of the Harrison Company, Ernest Wittenberg, and his wife, Elizabeth Wittenberg. And there's a picture of, her, of them here. And this was, they did a book tour all over Europe, and these are two newspapers from um, Brussels, uh, from Belgium. And in the press coverage of this event, they highlighted the growing similarities of the American style of, and the European style of, of public affairs. And there was definitely the sense that there was a lot to learn from the Americans. And for instance, here, the magazine Trends uh, had a headline um, that they called the event a blockbuster or the Berlin Mont and claimed that in one evening you will learn how to get the eye and the ear of the lawmakers in Brussels, Luxembourg, and Strasbourg. Another way to promote green communication was to write columns and articles positioning the idea that if companies do not seek representation, they are at economic and political risk. So this idea that you need to integrate environmental problems into your business model. And finally, also uh, another thing that Harrison did was to assert his authority and expertise over, it, over the field of green PR by seeking membership and stewardship in international organizations. So, as, um, so through the 1980s, Harrison had already been participating uh, in different international organizations and sort of like engaging with issues of sustainability. 
And in, for example, in 1984, he attended the first meeting of the World Industry Conference on Environmental Management. And at this meeting, organized by the United Nations in cooperation, in cooperation with the International Chamber of Commerce, um, sustainable growth was presented as an idea, as a principle that industry should accumulate, that industry should embrace. And a few years later, the International Chamber of Commerce formed an International Environmental Bureau in which Harrison participated and, take a, and took on a leadership role. And the mission of this uh, International Environmental Bureau was to take control of the sustain sustainability paradigm and to turn it to industry's advantage. So they created a network of like-minded organizations and developed standards and protocols to account for and promote industries' environmental activities. They created their own benchmarks, audits, codes of conduct, and certification programs. And by doing so, they developed an, a different way through which companies could engage with sustainability and also publicize their sustainability commitments. And so Harrison, so the 1992 Air Summit as an opportunity to launch this type of corporate of environmentalism to the general public. And sustainable development was at the center stage of that conference. The oil and gas uh, and other industries were very worried uh, because there was a sense that to tackle, of course, global warming, that would mean uh, more regulation for their operations. So Harrison helped these industries, her industry, his industry clients to prepare for a conference. And at the 1992 Earth Summit, they presented their own sustainable development charter and they proposed all these different kinds of self-regulated mechanisms and rules that businesses would agree to follow by when it came to environmental sustainability. This business charter didn't change things really, didn't transform companies' operations, but promoted the idea of going green, of being sustainable. And so after Rio, uh, Harrison really consolidated the concept of green communication. And in 1993, he published his book, Going Green, How to Communicate Your Company's Environmental Commitment, is the cover. And and to he, he, here in this book, he really formulates green communication as a form of environmental risk management and that is rooted in a soft approach to environmentalism. And here he brings back all these ideas about volu voluntary compliance programs, industry benchmark strategic alliances with environmental organizations, and proactive disclosure of environmental problems. Um, another thing that he proposes here is that instead of doing short-term crisis response, like most corporate PR did at the time, he defined sustainable communication as a process of continuous engagement. And soon after, in 1994, the AFP Harrison International Partnership uh, becomes Invaricom. And Invaricom's main goal was to promote in this value sustainability to professional tools and techniques of green public relations that Harrison had been developing over the years. And it worked as a kind of franchise network. And you can see here that they had their headquarters in the U in Washington and offices in the US, and they expanded to different bases in Europe. And they also had target the Asian market. Um, European firms, European public relations firms will join the network because it was, you know, giving that specialized expertise, but also will help them cert be certified as having this specialized knowledge. And it would also give them the ability to help clients, organizations to follow these self-regulatory programs, these new environmental standards that did not require government oversight. And so to implement the Invaricom vision, uh, Invaricom uh, did a lot of information sharing, capacity building and rule sharing among its members. And this is why we try to argue in this chapter that Invaricom worked as a kind of epistemic community. Uh, for example, um, Invaricom's core team based in Brussels and Washington produced bulletins, manuals and guidelines and circulated among their members. Harrison met 
directly with the network members two or three times a year. And at these meetings, they will talk about best practices, discuss political challenges, and debate future courses of action for the network. They also promoted the Responsible Care Program, which is a voluntary industrial compliance program developed by the Chemical Manufacturers Association in response to the Bhopal environmental disasters. And Invaricom really provided advice on how to implement this Responsible Care Program, including guidelines and specialized guidelines targeted, for instance, at plant managers and company divisions. They also recommended employee activities like lunch hour events where they will show films about responsible care and they also recommend community relations. Um, so in this chapter, by you know, providing a more in-depth explanation of all the activities that Embargo engage with, we are trying really uh, to argue here that they acted as an epistemic community in, in their ability to disseminate expertise and information and establish shared meanings and practice. Uh, we also try to show here that Invaricom um, was able to embed the concept of sustainable communication in international corporate approaches to environmental management. And that what they were doing basically was to present environmental concerns as problems of information, which the Invaricom experts could solve with the environmental skills. Another thing that is important to uh, reflect upon when it comes to Embaricom is that they really try to present industry leaders as creators and shapers of environmental information rather than passive recipients of information. And for instance, here's some material from the, sorry, some material from the Spanish office that says, and this is in Spanish, but it will read that the biggest environmental challenge is not technical, it's about educating the public. So it's a communication problem. Um, here it's also important to think about that all these new voluntary self-regulating standards and norms that Invaricom was promoting um, was an attempt to anticipate regulation, but also it deflects attention away from the actual requirements of environmental sustainability, such as preventing natural resource depletion or limiting energy and water consumption. Okay, so I think I still have time, so I would like to talk now about the methods. Um, so when we first learn about the Embarcom Network, we were looking at all of these archives, but especially at the truth of tobacco industry documents that, you know, per perhaps some of you are familiar with that archive. And it was kind of hard to put all the pieces together, but um, we look at all these sort of archives and we start gathering information. And from there, we were able to identify the members of the Embarcom Network and their clients. Uh, we also collected a lot of international news and magazine articles, as well as television segments figuring, uh, featuring Embarcom. We also reviewed white papers that members of the Embarcom network had published before and after the, the participation in this network. And also a big part of our time was devoted to tracking Embarcom's corporate clients across participation across organizations promoting sustainability. So for instance, in this chart here, you can see the, the clients and if they were an EVH client, if they participated in responsible care and what part of other sustainability, corp, corp, uh, corporate organizations promoting, promoting the sustainability they belong to. And this really took a lot of time because it was really like looking through all these different sources. And then um, after this, after this initial archival research stage, we contacted uh, the former Embarcom members. Many of them were re retired. Uh, some of them had passed away, uh, but they were willing to participate. Uh, we uh, used semi-structured interview guides and we asked about their professional trajectories and engagements with the field of green communication before and after joining the network. We asked them what constitutes the field of green communication and its evolution. And we also asked them about Embargo's values, its team, client portfolio, and services. 
these interviews uh, were about one hour long and we conducted them in English, French, and Spanish. Um, as we identified, the network had about 30 members across 12 consultant companies and one research institute. And when we sent emails to all of them, but only 13 uh, agreed to talk to us. Um, given the fact that these are experts and a lot of time had passed and some of them had passed away, we were actually, you know, we consider that although it was a low number of interviews, it was enough to help us complement our archival research. Um, at the time of the environment activities, most of the responders were senior level executives in PR who had been directly involved in their firm's negotiations to join the network. And at the time of our interview, some of them were still engaged in public affairs. Uh, some of them working in the same countries that they were working during the Embargo years. Um, so I said before that the, our interviews were very happy to, some of them were very happy to participate. And they were happy to participate because, well, perhaps they were nostalgic about the 90s, but I think this was, the, they saw this time, the time that they joined the network as a new age for their companies, a new moment where they were getting this specialized knowledge. So they had very clear memories of those meetings with Harrison in the 90s. Uh, some of them were, were kind to even give us strategy planning documents and company reports and press releases. And those were very helpful for us to reconstruct the network's business mission. Um, when they were talking about what they joined, many of them pointed out to the fact that joining the network was giving them a source of competitive advantage in securing clients. And, but also to, the sense of having access to this specialized knowledge. And for instance, one of our interviews noted, and I'm gonna read this quote here, that the field of environmental communication was very incipient in Spain when we joined the network. It was too novel. Our team felt a bit lost at the Embarcom's kickoff meeting in Rome, we received the decalogue of environmental communication. Looking back, I believe it was beneficial for Spain to become part of the global network, share ideas and learn from countries that were more advanced in this field. So this is just to give you a sense that, um, you know, like the, the, most of the people we interview were saw their participation in Embarcom in a very positive light and were nostalgic about this time. I felt that it was important for corporate culture to incorporate these ideas of young communication. Um, and I think that this is part of the good guy and bad guy narrative that sometimes um, we forget um, that the people participating in this, uh, they really believe that they are working to improve, to improve culture, corporate culture. Uh, of course, during the interview, some of them had uh, criticisms of these views perhaps being a little bit short-sighted at the time, but I think it, it gives a little bit more nuance on who these people are and why they're joining uh, this time. What would they be working in this field? Okay, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna leave it there, um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions regarding this, the method. Well, thank you to Melissa and Maria for that really exciting um, overview of your book and, and starting with that particular relationship to Harrison. Um, I'd like to open it up to to the floor for any of your any of your questions. I'll start then to warm us up. Oh, it looks like Amy's ready. Okay, Amy, go go ahead, shoot. I have so many questions. Um, first of all, congratulations to Melissa and Maria. It's just, this that was a great talk and the book looks amazing. Um, I can't wait to read it. So, you know, I, where to start with my questions? I guess one, one thing I was wondering when you were um, doing the interviews with, uh, I think it was 14, 13 or 14 um, folks who had been, a part of that organization, 
what did you tell them about what you were working on? You know, what was the, what were they expecting you to be asking them? Maria, do you want to go ahead? Because you, you did most of those interviews. Um, yeah, so what we were asking them was, um, um, what was their professional trajectory? How, what had they been doing before joining the network? What they knew about Green VR before and after joining the network? Um, what was their own definition of what Green VR was and how it had evolved over time? And we also asked them about what were the values of this network and what was their vision? Um, sorry, I think I, 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 did I miss a part of your question? No, no, that was my question. I was, okay. I was just wondering what they, you know, what they thought your project was about, but it sounds like you were, you were pretty general. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we were very general. Uh, we, um, and, and we did this, uh, in, in, we, when we contacted them, we did identify ourselves as academics, of course, and we even shared links to articles of things that Melissa had written or that we had written together, so they would have an idea of the type of work we were doing. So I think that they knew we were being critical and we were being academics. Um, and that's why perhaps some of them did not want the, to participate and give us their time. But um, I think that they understood that we were not trying to advertise the work that they were doing, uh, but more that we were curious about what was happening at that time. Um, I think an, another thing that came up a lot in these interviews was the historical period, like the consolidation of the European Union as a marketplace was very important for their yeah. business. Uh, and in general for society. So that's that's something that I really reflected upon and brought up a lot. And um, I didn't mention this, but as part of our interviews, we also realized that Embarcom was operating in Mexico. And in Mexico, it's followed a, sim a similar pattern in anticipation to the free trade agreement between Mexico and Canada. They also moved there and had were working with people there. So the people from Mexico also had all these very... Um, vivid memories about the meetings and how important that was because of the, the bigger context. It's really interesting. Thank you. Mimi, I, I was just wondering, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm following up with you. <laughs> I'm following up because I'm wondering if your question is sort of like, are you, are you suggesting maybe like, oh, they might not have wanted to talk to us because they knew we were going to be critical? Like, is that, was that somewhere in your question or did I? Yeah, and I also wonder sometimes um, how, you know, the people we talk to, the participants in our studies, um, how they how they frame their role in something depending on what they think we're after. Right, right. I, I mean, I think there, this is just, a, I'm just some reflections on interviewing in general related to, to that. Like one, the fact that we had spoken to Bruce Harrison first and that he, you know, he sort of legitimated everything else that came after. So everyone else we spoke to knew we had spoken to Bruce. And in some cases, oh, wow. I didn't know them ahead of time to say, yeah. you talk to these people. So he's your like key informant, huh? Right, right. So, yeah, we, yeah, so we interesting. Carpet in that. But more than that, I, I mean, and this is something, you know, having spent most of my career talking to like professionals in promotional industries. And I, I know some people here also do this kind of work. Like sometimes I think we're very nervous because we think, okay, they're gonna think we're there to dig up dirt on them and we're gonna expose them, you know, and some of them know that they've done things that are a little bit beside the law or around the law or that kind of thing, or just, you know, things that maybe would not be seen as having a social license. And yet when, I engage with people in the corporate universe, people in the corporate universe don't often think that what they're doing is wrong. They don't spend their days thinking about the wrongness of what they do. I think they mm. spend their days doing their job mm. and they're in that universe. And it's people who are not inside it often who I think sometimes create this narrative that we were talking about earlier, good guy. And yeah. So yeah. They don't necessarily, even, so just to say like, because I know, you know, we're not investigative journalists, so we have to be pretty transparent about what we're doing. We can't misrepresent our research and say, oh, we just want to hear yeah. more and then, you know, turn around and write some really negative. That, that's not what we do. But more than that, I don't think often that the perception of these people is that they're doing a bad thing. They're serving their clients. It's a service industry. Right? They are 
helping them to do what they want to do. And I think sometimes we forget that, especially when we're creating these um, dichotomies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's hear from uh, Julian and then uh, Caitlin, and then I'll go to the uh, chat. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Maria. Uh, glad to hear from you. Uh, I'm at uh, Ivy Business School in Canada, too, the, the London, Ontario that was mentioned before. Um, so I had an interview recently. I had a, an opportunity to do an interview with a conservative um, think tech person who was also, you know, but that does some work around climate change and climate action now. And the problem I encountered, and I, 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 I believe you may have encountered the same problem, was even though what I was curious about, this was exploratory, was some stuff that I already knew a little bit about from the media and from other interviews and sources I had read, I found talking to the a PR savvy person was like talking to Teflon, right? It's just, it was hard to get anything. I, I The person already knew the story on this subject, right? So you wouldn't volunteer any information on the subject other than, you know, the exact line that that was already out there. Yeah, I was curious how if you encountered any of, of, of that problem. Yeah, that's a great question because these PR people, perhaps more than anyone, are so sensitive to the media or to interviews, and they're very good at it. So it's hard to get them off of the narrative they already have that they've prepared their public persona. I think this ethnographic approach is one solution, certainly not the only one, but when we think about life trajectories, pressures they're facing, you know, things that are just not part of this, the media story, um, I think sometimes those can be very revealing in ways that we don't anticipate before we ask those questions. Um, and I mean, there's the general tendency, I think in interviews, people people enjoy talking about what they do all day. They, I, I, I have found with very few exceptions, people really like talking about themselves and what they do and how they see it. So asking questions that is about, questions that they can answer that are about who they are in their profession, how they see themselves in relation to the profession and what they see themselves doing for society through that profession, I have, I have found to be very useful ways of getting past that narrative. And then sometimes I will use the inf that information with the next person. Like I will use that as a, jumping off point to say this per you know, of course, maintaining confidentiality, this person A spoke to me about a certain pressure they were facing at work. How do you feel about that kind of a pressure? Because otherwise, you're right, you'll, you'll just get the same story you could have gotten without speaking to them. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you both so much for this talk. I'm so excited to read this book, and that it's finally out and the cover looks beautiful and it's congratulations. Um, I, have, I guess I have two questions. One of them is, is I guess sort of a methods question, particularly about, about Harrison. And, you know, for those of us who's, who sometimes study, like study up, right? Study people who have uh, positions of power or a lot of resources um, and are maybe engaged in activities that, you know, we are trying to understand from a nuanced analytical perspective, but also kind of have some objections to or criticisms of, but then like, they're so generous, right? Like he gave you so much of his time and all of his documents and he, you know, whatever his motivations were for doing that. And I guess I'm just wondering, how did you sort of balance the need to keep your analytical distance from him as a person, from his activities, um, the critical distance that you needed to do this work and also, you know, maybe feel charmed by him or, you know, that that he was being actually very generous in terms of how much of he, himself he shared with you or at least how much of his stuff. So that's one question. And then I guess my second question is sort of, um, if you ever talked to them, the people that you interviewed about, you know, greenwashing, I think that like, obviously there's become a, a notion that this kind of PR is A, very common and B, like just complete BS basically. Um, and, you know, that it's, that it's sort of like falsely, it's not communicating an environmental commitment that exists on behalf of these companies, but rather like, engineering one out of there um, that may or may not actually exist. And I'm just wondering 
how how did they respond to the notion of greenwashing as as a kind of concept so circulating in our culture and what did they have to say about that idea right um okay maria maria please feel free to jump in i'm gonna start but i um you know feel free if you have thoughts on that too so to your first question about critical distance i mean he, right this is this is the on the ethnographer's dilemma right it's it's not maybe it's not as far as Alice Goffman, but it's, you know, it's somewhere in there, we're all trying to figure out how to maintain a relationship with people and gain trust and have them feel like they can tell their story because only when they can tell their story in a way that doesn't maintain that PR-ness that Julian was talking about, do you feel like you're sort of getting somewhere? But on the other hand, you know, yeah, you, you can't, you can't make friends. So, you know, you can't, you can't really have that kind of bridge. And I think, Part of it was that, I mean, reminding, reminding oneself that we're, that we're invested in this for research purposes and trying to see it as one among several types of pieces of feedback. Like in other words, it wasn't, I said that Harrison was the backbone of our book and I think, I still think that's true, but it's not, the, it's not a book about E. Bruce Harrison. It's a much, much bigger book about a lot of things. And, you know, I think he tried to help us think about what some of those things were. But there was always a sense, and I, I think we, I tried to make that clear with Mr. Harrison as, you know, in our emails and exchanges, that this was a professional relationship. You know, it was not, it never crossed a line between where we forgot what our roles were, if that makes sense. So I still feel, because I still felt like he was giving me the PR version, but it was just a slightly less dressed up or more dressed up PR version, depending on how you look at it. I didn't really worry that it was, was that, am I answering? Well, can I just question? ask a quick, quick yeah. follow-up? Just like, I guess my question is, and I, you made me understand it better than it was when I originally phrased it, which is basically like, it is the ethnographer's dilemma, right? But I guess my question is, does the ethnographer's dilemma change when the person you are studying or the people you are studying are kind of in positions of real, material power um, in a way that, you know, Alice Goffman subjects most obviously were not, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, and how, how does that change the dilemma or the nature of the dilemma, or maybe it doesn't? Right. That's a great question. This, because, yeah, most of the time when we talk about that problem, you're right, it's more the Alice Goffman problem than it is the studying up problem, right? Like people, because the, the question of vulnerability of your subjects and so on. And, um, yeah, when you do, we, I've talked so ad, ad nauseum with so many people about IRB, you know, when you're trying to get review board approval to do interviews with people who are elites or professionals, it's much, much, much more straightforward, right? They, they, there's not a risk. The risk is not perceived by the review board, right? So there's already a kind of different approach that you take. I don't know, I, I'm not sure I have a great answer other than to sort of repeat a little bit what Julian and I were talking about, which is like knowing that these people are very savvy when they're talking to me and that they're going to think hard before they speak to me about what they say and how they say it. I think the challenge is to establish a relationship such that we understand one another, that I am not gonna turn around and accuse this person of greenwashing. Like, I'm not gonna throw a label on that person. I'm gonna try to understand that person. And this is back to the narrative thing. I'm not gonna come at it assuming this is a bad guy and I have to figure out how to sneak around and get answers from him. That, to me, that's not, a, that's not relationship building. That's not what ethnography is designed to do. It's more like, I wanna have a conversation with this person. I wanna put out what I'm thinking about this, but then I want that person to respond and, and help me think differently about it if that's the case. So yeah, it's very, I guess it's very iterative in that sense, but it, it's not very systemic, maybe. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Then you had a second question. Remind me, Caitlin. It was just if they had a take on the term of greenwashing and the, the kind of cynicism that circulates right. in our culture about these kind of environmental PR efforts. Right, yeah. So- Can I jump in? Yes, okay. yes, please go ahead. I, I was, yeah, I was just thinking about the interviews and. Um, in the case of the Environment Network, I don't think that they saw themselves as contributing to greenwashing. I think they saw themselves as improving these companies. But then at the same time, they were very reluctant to tell us which were their clients. Like most of that information, we learned it from the archives 
not necessarily from them. And it was always a trouble when we were asked for a specific, like, can you explain a campaign you did for a particular client? They were very, very careful to name any clients. So as Melissa was saying, they were very savvy. But I think like in that case, they felt like, um, it, like greenwashing was a problem that came later on or came by people, by companies that didn't take on this green communication approach that their clients did, or at least that's what they were trying to do. And um, yeah, and for it, I just wanted to mention another thing in a different chapter of the book, we talked to tech companies who are trying to promote big data to solve environmental problems. And in that case, they don't feel like they're all doing greenwashing. They feel like they are working for their public good because data and technology is going to save us. So, yeah, so it's just like, it, it varies. I think it also is a matter of the historical distance, perhaps because of the environmental network had been some time and at the period that they're working is when, you know, you now have all these ethnographic and historical accounts of cases of greenwashing is that perhaps it was something more present that came up in the interviews and sometimes they were even anticipating that question in a, in a way like they were <laughs> expecting us to come and ask them about greenwashing yeah yeah I, just as maria said that so i so i know we have other questions but i i'm so fast i'm so interested in this question because i think about it so often like if you call something greenwashing you're already you're making a judgment call there's a judgment call there. And I think when you're at the research stage, at least, you, you can't do that. You, you can ask them if they've, what they think of that label or how they would define it. And as Maria said, no one is gonna say, yes, we do greenwashing. No one is anti-environmental. That's, we know enough about social and cultural values that we know no one, no, everyone knows better than to say that. So they're gonna either point to other companies who aren't doing it right, they're going to say that's an ideological claim, right? That's how you call it. That's not what I would call it, right? Or And they'll say, you don't understand the complexity that we face in our organization. You know, yes, we're green at this level of our production chain, but we're not, you know, we can't be green at that level. And that's because people still want oil, right? People still want to fill up their big cars with gas. And so we're just responding to consumer demand. So yeah, so the greenwashing thing is almost like a, like you're, you're gonna inspire an immediate reaction and it's not gonna be a reaction that's gonna maintain that level of trust or conversation. So it's, it's not something that I would do in an interview unless it was like Maria said, kind of asking. Maria pointed out something else I just wanted to mention quickly, which relates to something um, I think Shravan was saying in the um, chat, which is about non-disclosure agreements and guidelines. Like many companies are not allowed to talk about who their clients are, even after the fact, even after they're retired and not supposed to. So if we really wanted somebody to speak about a company they worked for, we would have to find through archival research evidence of that. And then we could go to an interview and say, we see this, can you talk about it? And sometimes then that would be a way to get people to talk about an issue that was outside the norm, especially if we made, you know, if they said, we'll tell you, but you can't use that name of the company in your thing, you know, that's off the record then of course it's off the record. But it was a good way to get, like that combination of interviews and archival research was a very good way to get some of this stuff. And we were very lucky that the tobacco, the truth tobacco campaign had, has already exploded and that all of the discovery, all of the material from that is online because there are so many similarities across polluting sectors of public relations tactics that you can go, this is an online archive, it's thousands and thousands of documents and you can find so much information about strategies, tactics, approaches that took place in tobacco. And very often the PR firms are the same, the people are the same, the strategies are the same. So we, we were very lucky in that way to do this kind of research. Let's go to, um, well, well Shrevan, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying your name incorrectly and I apologize. Um, did you get your, was that, did that speak to your question enough or did you wanna um, have Melissa touch on that and Maria touch on that a bit more? Your question is about access and about um, um, NDAs. I think Shravan responded in the chat that it was. Uh, okay, wonderful. Um, so let's hear from uh, Daphna and then Ella back in the chat. 
Thank you. So I'm joining the chorus of saying how wonderful the presentation was, and I love the question and answer response, and congratulations to Melissa and Maria. I My question is actually methodological. So um, ethnographic work is oftentimes a lonely solitude work of one person, uh, given that as a researcher, you are the instrument of the research in many ways. Uh, in your case, it's a duo, and it's a duo of two women who are in different places in their career. Um, I, I'm just really curious to hear about how you work together, um, just about the, the kind of how, how that collaboration actually materialized. If you can share a little bit about that, I'd love to hear that. Maria, you want you want to go ahead, or you want me to talk? I need to go first. <laughs> <laughs> so Maria Espinosa, as, as we said at the beginning, Maria is a doctoral candidate here in sociology. And um, we started out with a relationship of uh, Maria as a research assistant. And I mean, the truth is, I, I think it's always true that research assistants often do like so much work that it doesn't really get recognized the way it ought to be uh, in large projects. But in this case, it was just, Maria was just so good at coming up with ideas about the structure of the book, at seeing connections among texts that I hadn't seen, and also at doing, I will never be able to do like a summary of literature the way Maria can do. Like I have never yet been able to do that. She had would give me these like 20 or 30 page annotated literature reviews with a, an analysis of them and a kind of story that emerged from them. And it just became very clear that we could not, I, that she was a, a co-author on this and not just a research, you know, just a research assistant. Again, I don't mean to set it up in a hierarchy like that, but it just, it's, it's a recognition that so much of what we do is really not alone. Like I think of at this stage of my career, I think if I could put Duke as a co-author, I would because the writing groups are so generative. Like so many ideas that I've had about actually teaching also and writing have come from the writing groups that we have in the digital ethnography working group. It's so necessary to have other people helping you think through your ideas and then showing you what it is you don't know and helping you put together what, what you do. It's it's really impressive. And, and then for the actual ethnography, the actual interviews, we had the advantage of multiple languages. So I speak French and Maria speaks Spanish. And so we were able to conduct interviews in those languages. It helped us really understand the international dimension of Envirocom, as she was discussing, in a way that I think we couldn't have done if we hadn't been able to speak in different languages. So that helped too. Maria, do you want to add something from your perspective? No, uh, yes. So this was a wonderful opportunity for me, of course, as a grad student. And Melissa really interested me, not just doing the lead reviews and looking through the archives, but then she really involved me in the process of early on of like discussing ideas, like what's the story, what are we looking for? And I think um, as a grad student, it was such a great opportunity to have the support of somebody who encourages your research ideas and and yeah and I'm so thankful for that and 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 yeah and you know like the way we work is usually like we look at the archive we come up with questions go back to the archive identify people that we can interview or sources and then we go on and explore them and um, Melissa is very horizontal and very encouraging so I think I like this has been my one of my best research experiences for ever and um, so yeah it's been a great pleasure to work on this project well thank you both and congratulations thank you thanks Daphne Ella would you like to um read your question or I can take I, the liberty. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's already written out. Um, okay, so this is a question about, um, as IPCC reports identify, if we fail to take quick action on climate, the impacts are catastrophic. Okay, given the urgency of the climate crisis, do you think there is a communication advantage to painting anyone as bad guys? Or is there something to humanizing all and not identifying villains? Do you have insights or thoughts on where we go next in mobilizing the public to collective climate action towards a just and viable future for all? Yes, I mean, these are 
So, you know, thanks, Ella. I see you said you don't have a mic, so no, no problem. <laughs> thanks for being here. Um, you know, those questions are so material, right? Those are, and I think this is why I've become really so passionate about this research. I mean, I think I'm always pretty passionate about what I do, but I feel, I feel like urgently passionate at this stage because of um, these kinds of questions that you're asking. So to, to the first question about the communications advantage, right? Like what, you know, because it's, I know that it's not necessarily a popular thing to say, hey, let's try to get past this good, bad, we're all in this together. But I want to be a little careful here. It's, it's a little more subtle than just we're humanizing everyone. Like, I mean, yes, everyone is a human that we are speaking to. So there is that courtesy we need to extend when we are working with all kinds of people, um, that they're human beings and they have families and they should be treated with respect when we're engaging with them. But I don't, I don't, it's not that I disagree that there are ill-intentioned people and well-intentioned people when it comes to the climate crisis that we face now. I think that it is clear that there are some groups of people, some industries, some sectors that have made a choice about what they're gonna prioritize. And that priority has been um, oil and gas development, for instance, you know, fossil fuel development, um, even knowing the environmental cost, um, and it's justified in a variety of ways. We, we know that. So I didn't mean to suggest that I don't think that, it's just more that we know it and we have research on it and we continue to do good research on that topic. So, and that continues to be important. It's more that if sort of like what Caitlin and we were discussing with Caitlin, it's like, if we walk in with, you know, with a hat that says greenwasher and we put it on the head of the person that we're speaking to, we just miss the opportunity to learn a lot about people's motivations, why they do what they do and how they think about what they do. And I think accessing that can give us a lot of very important clues about what to do next to, this, to your second question, like on how to mobilize the public. Because it's not either like the good and bad guys are merely the fossil fuel producers and all, you know, all the ordinary people are, um, you know, one big mass of people who, who totally agree that we need to urgently deal with the climate crisis. As we well know, there are some people who don't think that it's urgent. Um, I think there are fewer and fewer people who deny it entirely, but that's enough. Like, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not as concerned as I used to be about denialism because I don't, I think denialism looks very different these days. It doesn't come from actually not believing that climate change is real, it just comes from not believing it's as urgent as it is or as massive or planetary as it is. So I guess one thing I would say about mobilizing the public is something we talk about in the conclusion of the book, which is a kind of you know a wrap up where it's like, well, ultimately what does PR do to climate change? Even if we were talking about what climate advocates do with PR, we still see a kind of um, instrumentality. There's a sense that we're going to put the information together and it's going to be the good information about environmental change or what we need to do to mitigate um, global warming. And we're going to put it out there and then everyone's going to read it and they're going to he you know, hear it and then they're going to act. And unfortunately, we know that that isn't true. We have a lot of great research um, that shows that, you know, with Lauren Feldman here who's work on media effects, <laughs> talk a lot about what kinds of media effects um, have impact and what, which, you know, what kinds of framings, what kinds of um, strategies are necessary to get people thinking carefully about, about the impact. But public relations is really good at fragmenting audiences at, and at instrumentalizing the information and at trying to say, let's talk to different groups of people in different ways and we'll try to get them where they live. We'll try to appeal to their self-interest. And that's where I think we are running into trouble is that appealing to self-interest is anathema to what we really need to be doing. I don't actually think that messaging in people's self-interest is a strategy that will make us aware of the magnitude of this problem. I feel like the collective part of your question and the public part of your question should be about thinking about what it means to understand a problem as a problem, like I said at the beginning. Understand that it's a public problem and that we are that public. Um, so that we're all actually recognizing it for what it is. I hope that wasn't too um, abstract, but um, that's sort of how I think about it. Would anyone else like to 
raise a question for our authors. Um, Hannah, Hannah had a question uh, in the chat. You still there, Hannah? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Yeah, Th first of all, thank you so much. This is such a wonderful talk and I'm really excited to read your book. And it's just very fascinating to me too, the time period, you know, and this is a really important time period for the global environmental movement, also, you know, globalization, neoliberalism, um, and the time period for interpreting, you know, the interviews. I'm, I'm curious how you engaged with specifically the historical context, you know, how you integrated that into your analysis. Um, I was really curious to hear how you sort of thought through and uh, you know brought in the historical process and method to this too. Yeah, I know Maria, you want to talk about the 90s a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that um it's very interesting because there's a lot of things about corporate culture that we take for granted. Like for instance, the whole idea of corporate social responsibility or the idea that they have to engage in environmental issues. Like when I started doing the program, I really took that for granted. And doing the archival research, I ended up realizing, and Melissa was aware of this, but like, it was so interesting to talk to her about this, like how the 90s was this people at the moment where like, you know, we have other people writing about the informative of environmentalism, how environmental problems have become information problems and how that can be very problematic. And I feel like the 90s was really a turning point for that. And so it's very interesting to find notes for from Harrison had meetings with the tobacco, the chemical industry, pesticides, uh, and then with when they went to Europe, like with their clients in Europe, and you have all these notes of how they talk about shifting the narrative and pushing this idea of sustainability and environmental or sustainable communication and have their clients adopt it. And now that is totally mainstream, but at the time it wasn't mainstream. Like he felt like he knew he was doing something new. He knew he was a leader. And so that that is very interesting because this is a person working behind the scenes. Um, I mean, it, it was very interesting to me. And, and the other thing that I wanted to say, and this relates to the previous question is like, um, the problem of making environmental problems information problems is that then you start believing if we only have the right information, we're gonna to come to a solution. And I think at many times we, when we were discussing the book, we were like, perhaps we don't need more information to make it more technical, like instrumental. We just need to go and take action, you know? But by these companies, especially in the 90s, starting to go to these, UN meetings are becoming important players at the UN United Nations meetings and sort of like opting this concept of sustainability. They were like, oh, okay, you want to make environmental burn information burn? Include me because I have the best information. I am the best at doing that. I have, I know very well how to run my company. And so you, I can bring you my own knowledge to tackle these environmental problems. And it's actually in my best interest, right? And so Corporations have been very good at putting forward this narrative. And now today the problem is like, we don't really know how, like you, they will say, but we are sitting at the table and we want to be part of the solution, but the solution is not happening because the solution is being informatized. It's all about the information. It's not about taking real action. It's not about regulations. And that's something that the environmental movement before the 90s in the 70s and the 80s was pushing for. And they, they lost in a way. And so I think, um, yeah, like the historical perspective is very important. And I looked into these archives and being able to follow the career of this person over the span of 50 years was really fascinating. Yeah, can I, can I jump in on that too? And just say that uh, the night, I'm so glad, Hannah, that you asked about the 90s, because I feel like when people say, well, when people my age say historical, like we don't actually think of the 90s as being historical. I mean, my kid says like, that's so old, it's from 2011 when I realized how old I am. But my point is um, the 90s was, you know, the story of neoliberalization and um, privatization and deregulation was a good news story for industry. It was new markets all over the world. It was, you know, it was NAFTA, it was the European community, the European Union. It was, so for a lot of people in that universe, the 90s are a moment of great nostalgia from today's vantage point. And I think that we, we all, we really do tend to forget that because in critical literature, you, you never hear of the 90s as being an era for which people are nostalgic. 
but then also uh, just to reinforce what Maria said, like this was also a moment, it was such an important turning point. And that Rio, that Earth Summit was such a turning point because business had not thought about their environmental footprint other than to um, see it from an antagonistic perspective until around that moment. I mean, it wasn't from one day to the next it ramped up over time, but for such a long time, the only way that companies would respond to you know, the concerns of the environmental movement from the 60s forward was in a uh, defensive posture. It was, it was just to try to prevent regulation from taking place. It wasn't to actually do anything about the environment. So this idea of corporate social responsibility that became so massive, corporate citizenship, you know, triple bottom line, um, ESG metrics, carbon footprints, all that stuff um, became a thing in the 90s. And so suddenly companies were like, wait a minute, we can do good while doing well, right? Hey, this is a great way for us to go green. And like Maria said, Harrison was the, was the leader there. He was, he was there. When they all started thinking about it, there he was with his expertise, his methods, his certification programs, his training seminars, and so on. So you know, he was in the right place at the right time, but I think that's just so important for us to think about what the 90s were for companies in that era. Well, Thank now you. that- we, Thanks so much for that. Now that we've um, reconnected with the 90s and it's uh, exactly 2.30 in the present, um, feels like a good place to leave off and to thank our authors for writing this fabulous book, which I encourage you to go out and buy. And thank you for sharing your process some, and thank you to all of you for joining us on a Friday afternoon for a really nice conversation and take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Take care. Thank you.